Hi there. What exactly is wrong with capitalism? In this video, I'll enumerate a few basic points which can help in grasping why capitalism has outlived its usefulness, and it's time to go beyond. Not from a moralistic perspective, but from one based on the evidence. This is timestamped, so feel free to skip around, these aren't in any particular order. Starting off, capitalism's boom and bust cycles. Here, I refer people to look at Engels' 12th point in his lovely little pamphlet titled The Principles of Communism. In summary, capitalism dominates, continuously expands production at faster rates and for cheaper prices. Where money is to be made, many capitalists flock. This happens on a system-wide basis. This is the boom. With this invasion of capitalists into a profitable field, many, many commodities are produced, far exceeding the market need. Because of this, many finished commodities sit on store shelves or company warehouses, collecting dust unsold. Without the sales necessary to recoup the investment made by said capitalists, an economic crisis occurs. Factories close, capitalists go out of business, workers lose jobs, and the living standard plummets. After a while, either these goods finally make their way to being sold, or are purposely destroyed, as is common practice in late-stage capitalism. And things slowly get back to normal. Factories open up, jobs come back, and businesses go right back to booming. Not long after this, though, the same issue arises, producing a new crisis. This is the natural tendency of capitalism, to fluctuate between periods of prosperity and periods of crisis, which results in the destruction of the lives of millions. It can be regional or worldwide. It can take 4 years between crises or 15. What is a constant, though, is that it always happens, and is always catastrophic. For the working class, that is. The capitalist class always finds a way to come out richer in the end. Funny how that works. To quote Engels directly, nearly every 5 to 7 years, a fresh crisis has intervened, always with the greatest hardship for workers, and always accompanied by general revolutionary stirrings and the direct peril to the whole existing order of things. This has only worsened with the modern introduction of credit in everyday life, which will be discussed shortly. Our second point, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. This is a simple concept to grasp. Capitalists want as much profit as possible, and can do this by outcompeting the competition. This is usually done by new changes in technologies or special access to production facilities and resources, among other reasons. This relative advantage over the competition allows one capitalist to sell product A cheaper than all of his or her competitors. As a result, said capitalist enjoys higher profits temporarily because they pull customers from their competitors. Cheaper prices for the same quality of goods is attractive, after all. However, as this is happening, the same competition scrambles to catch up. Once they do catch up, however, they're back to square one. Except now, they're stuck with a faster and more efficient form of production that results in cheaper average prices of product A, and as a result, less profits overall. Less profits means less reinvestment into the circuit of capital, to grow production, to continually develop. Economic slowdown leads to crisis. Crisis leads to the breakdown of capitalism, as well as political turmoil due to mass unemployment and the sharpening of the class struggle. An oversimplification for ease of understanding, but the point still comes across, I think especially when you look at the empirical evidence. For a more in-depth look, check out this video by the Marxist project titled Fundamentals of Marx, Falling Profit Rates. A somewhat related subpoint is the irrationality of capitalist practice. Outsourcing, for example, drains jobs from one country in order to exploit cheap labor in a different country, with the intent to produce products more cheaply so you can import them back into the original country and expect people with no jobs, because they moved overseas, to buy them more cheaply. Credit was a temporary solution that has now pushed capitalism crisis even further into the ground. We'll talk about these lovely features in the next few points. Our third point. Unlimited growth in a limited world. Capitalism as a system is built upon infinite growth. It cannot develop, let alone maintain its existence, without ever increasing consumption and production for consumption. The Earth has finite resources, and there is a logical limit to how much an average person, and populations, can consume. This relatively simple point has many severe consequences. A system predicated on infinite growth in a finite environment predisposes itself to two potential end results. Either it expands beyond logical limits, ruining said environment in the process and possibly causing the extinction of the trivial creatures that gave rise to it, or it gives room for another system, one with rational allocation of resources and one based on respecting the limitations the Earth has placed upon us. We see the effects of this never-ending quest for needless expansion for the sake of profits with our rising tides, ruined rivers, increasing global temperatures, and the ongoing mass extinction event going on at this very moment. To quote Rosa Luxemburg, our choice is clear, either it is socialism or barbarism. 
More appropriately nowadays, though, either it is socialism or extinction. Our fourth point. Profit over all else. This is a point of overarching importance regarding capitalism. As a result of competition in the marketplace, capitalists seek to attain as high profit as possible. What this results in is, essentially, capitalists attempting every single method, be they ethical or not, to reach said goal. In this case, nothing is off the table. The law being the government and directly circumventing the democratic will of the people is America's pastime at this point. Ruin of the environment, circumventing labor laws such as overtime laws or 39-hour contracts to avoid paying workers or wage theft, etc. Even assassination and overthrow of governments at home and abroad, Central American history in particular, with the United Fruit Company, and Latin American history as a whole is a testament to this. They don't do this because they're particularly evil or scheming, but because the nature of the system demands it. If you fall behind, another capitalist gets the upper hand, secures higher profits, outcompetes you in the market, and wins. Essentially, capitalism rewards corruption. And even when strong state institutions exist to curtail this failure of the capitalist system, it's little more than a theatrical cat and mouse game, where a token capitalist gets caught, gets a slap on the wrist, and back to business it is. Capitalism values profit, and profit alone. A system built atop profit solely will always need state intervention to correct its excesses, and as a result will always succumb to political and other corruption. Thing is though, it isn't technically corruption, it's just the capitalist state doing its regular job. It's supposed to serve the interests of the capitalist class. Just how brazenly it's done is what determines how corrupt it is. However, to argue that capitalism, but with a heavy hand behind it, holding the reins, would be the solution, fails. Because, one, the capitalists that successfully manage to corrupt and gain influence, and hence more convenient legal rights or opportunities for development, meaning higher profits, would win out over the honest capitalists, outcompeting them and essentially proving that this form of corruption is the only way to get ahead. A capitalist who plays by the rules ends up with less profits. Less profits means less money and resources to reinvest into the circuit of capital meaning less development, or advertising, or whatever else, which will end up always in the same result. They will lose to a far more fierce and shrewd businessman, who will repress wages to as low as they can go, extend the workday as long as they can possibly get away with it, circumvent every law and regulation through either bribe or flagrant dismissal of the nation's justice system, and in the end be rewarded for this behavior with record profits. This leads to point number two. We are basically relegating ourselves to a never-ending upward fight against political corruption, whether it be respectable corruption in the form of convenient state favors by the capitalist state, or via the more audacious forms we normally associate with political corruption. A related subpoint to this would be, because of the senseless drive for profit, there is incentive for the irrational orientation of resources for that which would garner the most profit, rather than meet the needs of the population. That's why in the overexploited countries of the imperial periphery, and even at home in the grand US of A, we see state institutions and private companies scrambling to build luxury condos for rich tourists rather than proper housing for the working class. Point number five, capitalism and meritocracy. A common trope we hear is that capitalism is a meritocratic system, that whoever works hard enough will see their dreams realized and will attain success and wealth. Now, like with trickle-down economics, most people grow out of such delusions and see capitalism for the system it really is. It rewards privilege before it rewards merit. Many opportunities, education for example, are barred from those of poor origins because they simply lack the wealth to enter them. Entry into some of the greatest institutions of the world are less based on merit and more based on kickback favors of entry to the children of generous donors. Starting businesses, too, a cornerstone of the American dream, is far less accessible than it's made out to be. The Bezoses, Gates, and Musks of the world all came from incredibly wealthy and connected families, which would secure their place in the necessary educational institutes, would secure mentors and educators for them, would secure financial support for their fledgling business and all the connections necessary to make it. As funny as it seems, the small loan of a million dollars that Trump spoke of is truly the essence of capitalism. Even if you were to claim that it is by merit, which in some rare exceptions it might be, could you really say that? by the income differential between the average Musk or Bezos and their workers, that said Musks and Bezoses are more meritorious by a factor of, or work 10, 20, 50,000 times harder than their workers as to warrant their wealth. No, you can't in good faith claim this, as it stands against reason. Point number six, the reserve army of labor and everlasting unemployment. A point beautifully elucidated by Marx, whereby under capitalism, a consistent chunk of the population would be employed, because capitalism requires a consistent workforce, unlike in feudal and ancient times. The paradox is, though, that even though there are not nearly enough hands to administer the massive productive potential of most countries and economies, 
capitalism necessitates a reserve army of labor, meaning a perpetually existing significant group of unemployed, in order to facilitate the lowering of wages and always provide capitalists with an ever-eager workforce that will work for pennies in difficult conditions for long hours so they don't starve. Not only this, but said reserve army of labor exists too so that capitalists can point at it to scare currently employed workers into submission, should they demand things too outrageous like, heaven forbid, livable wages. Ever wonder why every single capitalist country has unemployment? Usually quite significant even, a numbering in the millions in some countries. This is the reason. Point number 7. Decentralization of capital. Capitalism tends to monopoly. This is a fundamental tendency of the system. It's not only a natural process of the system, but also absolutely necessary for its development. There is market competition, yes? What happens in a competition? Someone wins. When they win, do they let the loser keep their market share? Of course not. As competition goes on, winners arise and monopolies begin to form. Take a look at any product. Really, think of a random product of any kind, preferably one that has been established for a while. Look at how many producers existed for said product in the 50s, and how many producers exist now. Video game console manufacturers are a good example of this. Computer parts, automobile manufacturers, home appliances, think of practically anything. 9 times out of 10, there are less producers now than there were in the 50s. What does this mean, concretely? It means in competitions, winners emerged. It means monopolies and oligopolies form, ironically cancelling out all the supposed benefits of capitalism, that being variety, the possibility of starting a small business, competition, etc., etc., and exerting pressure, on government or otherwise, for their interests, as monopolies usually do. This doesn't only apply to tangible goods, too. Internet services, media sources, etc. all undergo the same process. That's why a handful of companies own all popular and news media in the US, for example. So much for the free press. This leads into the point mentioned prior about corruption, too. See how it all ties together, no? Point number 8. Class antagonism. One of the main contradictions of capitalism is the fundamental class antagonism of the capitalist and the worker. The capitalist wants their workers to work as much as possible, as hard as possible, for as long as possible, for as little money in compensation as possible. The worker, on the other hand, wants to be compensated as much as possible for the work they do. They have diametrically opposed interests. As a result, they strive for different objectives. Workers want higher wages, shorter working hours, improved safety standards, etc. Capitalists want lower wages, lower working hours for their workers, less and less safety nets of all kinds, sometimes literal in the case of the mining industry. With this difference of objectives, there is struggle. As a result of the struggle, political instability forms, and capitalists, who hold political power in capitalist states, undermine real democratic initiatives and institutions by whatever way they can either by bribery, by lobbying, why am I saying the same thing twice, by manipulative nonsense like giving away sandwiches in return for a vote in many third world countries, or by outright violent state repression, amongst other things, but we won't get into labor aristocracy or Gramscian concepts of cultural hegemony here. As a result of this, there's always politics in flux, always class struggle that at times is more dormant, like in, for example, the richer European social democracies, and at times incredibly heightened, like in India at this very moment. This means that peace and stability is not an option, because the capitalist system fundamentally originates this contradiction. It's the default, sometimes offset, but never gotten rid of. Number 9. The impossibility of a solution within the system. All hitherto developed remedies for the failures and contradictions of capitalism have only postponed the inevitable. Lower wages as far as they can go to maximize profits as much as possible. But hold on. Those same workers that you've reduced the wages of are the very same consumers you hope will buy your products. This was a significant problem before globalization and the invention of the credit system. An ingenious development where instead of paying for things with existing money you have, you can instead loan the money and pay it back on interest. Hold on again though. These same workers don't make nearly enough money to pay it back, let alone the interest on top of it. Combine that with predatory loaning and buy-ups of debt packages meant specifically to harass the absolute poorest into paying exorbitant amounts of money, and you have an issue. Bubbles speculated on and the endless desire for profits cause a whole fictitious system to rise up, running emotions high until the whole damn thing crashes, horrifically, rendering countless millions homeless and unemployed, destroying businesses and ruining production lines. For a species that considers themselves intelligent, hell, we've named ourselves homo sapiens, wise men. We sure are running a stupidly irrational system. Boom and bust cycles are no different. The Keynesian solution of higher taxation during the boom to offset the bust fails because, well, the taxation pool, when not applied to the capitalist class, interesting how conveniently that always works out, is fairly limited and stands to fall as well as a result of capitalist policies. Modern Keynesian methods at mitigating capitalist crises have all met failure as proof of this. 
Universal Basic Income, or UBI, is another Hail Mary attempt of capitalism, where capitalists try to artificially sustain a consumption standard of the population by just straight up giving people money for consumption purposes. The contradictions of this are more or less self-evident, but possibly I should make a dedicated video to this point eventually. The general point is this. These contradictions of capitalism will surface again and again and will further entrench themselves, heightening the class struggle and destabilizing the system from within. Conclusion This is not by any means an exhaustive list, as I'm not touching on capitalism and its relation to imperialism, for example, or its reproductive tendency of inequality, or the myriad of other issues that are inherent to the system. At most, this was a basic breakdown of just a few points. If you'd like further reading, I'd recommend Marx's two short works titled Wage, Labor, and Capital and Value, Price, and Profit for an introduction to Marxian analysis of capitalism. For general criticism of capitalism by a non-Marxist economist, I'd recommend Ha Jun Chang's works, such as 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. For a deeper look into the contradictions of capitalism, take a look at David Harvey's 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. Finally, for an easy-to-read and general introduction to the usual objections against Marxism, take a look at Terry Eagleton's book titled Why Marx Was Right.